Okay. Oh Brother, Not Another Podcast is a co-production of Verso Studios and the incredible new Westport Library with me, Trace Burroughs. And me, Mix Burroughs. Why don't you introduce Okay, well, today we have Michael Friedman, um, who has a, an incredible collection of um, iconic rock and roll photographs that he took um, going through decades, years ago. Tell us a little bit about that collection. Well, I, I took most of these pictures um, between 1968 and 1973 when I was in the music business. And uh, I was not a professional photographer, but I was a serious amateur photographer. And so I used to bring my camera along with me on gigs and recording sessions and so forth because I was working as a manager in the music business. Um, and make a long story short, I t I, uh, what uh, what we came across, I, I, I had lost all my negatives um, ab about before I even had a chance to print most of them. Um, and so I, years and years ago, decided they were gone forever. And about a year and a half ago, my wife Donna uh, was doing some stuff in the attic, trying to get rid of some boxes. And she came across an old box with music uh, business contracts and papers and so forth. And in there was an envelope which contained 50 rolls of negatives uh, that I had shot back in those days, but had basically never seen. And uh, that's what sort of began this kind of amazing journey that I've been on for almost two years. Um, and so, that's that's where the that's where the pictures came about. I'm curious when you were taking the picture. So you didn't print, you didn't take pictures and go, oh, I can't wait to get this role developed. I mean, you just just kept the the roles and didn't ever did anything with them. Well, you know, it was <clears throat> it was kind of a serious hobby. I I, I I did print some as I there were certain pictures that I took for a specific reason, like um, I would do a publicity sh uh, shoot because I needed a photograph of an artist we, that I was working with. Um, I, I came across in, within these negatives some pictures that I was familiar with. Uh, there was a couple of pictures of Janis Joplin that I had used for uh, a little songbook that we put together for her, and then there was one of Paul Butterfield that was used for a promotional thing, another one of James Cotton. Um, but I never, I mean, all the pictures of the band and um, there was a few from Todd Rundgren that uh, you know, one was an album co inside album cover for the first Naz album which I had totally forgotten that I even took um, and uh, but basically they were you know I was into photography I was into uh, sort of reportage photography through <coughs> a friend of mine who was a professional photographer in New York he was a fashion photographer he and I went to Staples together <coughs> Who was and, uh, Bruce Lawrence. Sure. You're too okay. young. You're too young to remember. <laughs> too, young. <laughs> but, uh, too old to remember anything. <laughs> <laughs> he was he was a terrific <clears throat> photographer, and he had a studio on, on uh, in the 30s somewhere on the West Side. And I used to go hang out at his studio, and he he taught me how to take photographs, uh, you know, other than just like posing snapshots kind of pictures. So, so was. Uh, the first, uh, when you went out shooting photographs of, of rock bands, was this part of when you were doing PR for um, music was groups, or is it like when you're doing the management thing? A, a little bit when I was doing PR. Um, that was my first job in the music business, <clears throat> and I was doing PR for the Mamas and Papas and uh, Glenn Campbell and the Paul Revere and the Raider and some of those kind of pop groups. and. I think I, you know, none of the pictures that I took of them have turned up yet, but we don't even know if there's others because I can't remember. Uh, <laughs> but so far we've got about 2,000 natives, and we're still working on them. We haven't, we haven't uh, printed all of them. Oh, you're really? still, there's still more? Yeah. <laughs> we, just, we just did a, a, a wonderful event at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. They're, they're having a six-month exhibit of the photos now. And... Um, we, when we were trying to pick out which 
photographs to put in there. We had, the curators had already picked what they planned to hang, and we actually found <laughs> more, a few others that we were uh, that we were working on. That my wife was working on, and uh, so that sort of changed the order out there. They actually put some of those in there. Um, oh. So when you were taking them, I'm just curious. Do you have any sense, this is early on, so we, we, did you have any sense you were in the presence of greatness? Or was this just like, oh, there's some band playing and they happen to be called the band? I mean, did you just, was there any sense no, of their it, destiny? It, it, you know, I, I talk about this and I'm writing a book around the photographs right. now and about my experience. And, and that's something that I addressed um, just this week when I was um, <clears throat> writing. And, and what I said was, uh, I, of course, I knew that I was in the presence of sort of iconic artists. I mean, I mean, everybody knew at the time that Bob Dylan was a great songwriter. Everybody knew that the band was a great band and that Janice was a great singer. So these people were famous. Um, there was no, you know, it wasn't like shooting your high school band. Yeah. But we had no historical perspective. Um, we were just, I was a kid, I was the same age as the people that I was managing. And so, you know, we were just doing what we were doing, like anybody. And it was kind of like, oh, this is what I'm doing. And now, in hindsight, it seems different because of the historical perspective. You know, looking back at that time as much as the artists and realizing that this was not just, these were not just iconic artists it was an important time and the artists that i was lucky enough to be working with were part of that i mean they helped the, the uh you know the kids of my generation change the world it was you know vietnam and woodstock and all these things were going on we had no idea that that was going to be 50 years later something that people would still be very interested in and and that the music from that period would still be very relevant and would still be attractive to, or, you know, people would be interested in it 50 years. 50 years is like, a, you know, it's a lifetime. Yeah. yeah. Did, you, did you ever go to Monterey Pop Festival? I didn't go to Monterey. Mm -hmm. No, I, um, uh, actually, I joined Albert Grossman um, just after Monterey. <clears throat> joined him when... Uh, the Big Pink album came out and when Janice had uh, her first album on Columbia, but that was after Monterey. She was discovered at Monterey, and so she hadn't, there hadn't been nothing come out at that point. But you told a great story at one of your d exhibits. Why don't you tell it, but it's a fight that Janice, that you witnessed. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Janice <laughs> involved. The, the famous Hell's Angels story. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, yeah, this was a, this was a night I always describe as the craziest night of my life, <laughs> and I haven't changed my story. <laughs> um, we were we had put together a band for Janice, her her final band called the Full Tilt Boogie Band. This was to replace the Cosmic Blues Band, which was the successor to Big Brother and the Holding Company Band. <laughs> and all of this happened within a course of a year and a half or something, but. Um, so we put together a new band for her, and um, we rehearsed the band out at her house in uh, California, in Larkspur, which is in Marin County, just over the <coughs> Golden Gate Bridge. And we brought the guys out there, and they rehearsed for about a month or so. And at some point, I realized that, you know, that the band was ready to showcase. They looked like they were set to go. So I said to Janice, you know, let's do a gig somewhere just under undercover, kind of a low key thing and, you know, test out the, uh, put our feet in the water. So I said, do you have a preference? You live out here. Do you have a preference of a, kind of a venue that might, might work? And uh, she said, <clears throat> she said, yeah, well, you know, I'm, I'm friends with all the Hell's Angels out here. And uh, she says, you know, they need some money for their chapter. And, uh, <laughs> Why don't we do a free concert for them? They'll love it. So <laughs> I said, well, I think that's really a bad idea. <laughs> and she said, and she said, great, I'll tell the guys. <laughs> and we'll put it together. <laughs> Not people are waving. Uh, uh, so um, 
So I, I uh, agreed. I mean, that's what she wanted to do, and I thought it was a terrible idea, but we went ahead and booked this little this motel called the uh, Bermuda Palms in San Rafael, and it was a rundown motel with a venue attached to it. And um, it held about 500 people. So the Hells Angels were thrilled. We figured they would you know, sell tickets to this thing and get money for their, for their club. And uh, it, it turned out that they decided to make it just a party for the Hells Angels, and they charge a dollar to each other. Uh, admission. I still have my ticket from yeah. that. Um, what were they paying Janice? Stains on it? <laughs> 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 what were they paying Janice? Do you remember? Or? Nothing. Oh, it was, nothing. It was, it was just a. Yeah, uh, it, was it was a free. benefit. Yeah. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> so we uh, we get to the to the venue and there's like a 500 Harley Davidson circling this building and guys out front with shotguns. No police, no security, nothing. The police were like a block away. They didn't want to even get near the building. I could never understand how they ever got permission to do this. But anyway, we, I go inside, and there's, you know, roughly 500 people in there. Most Everybody was a Hells Angel or a Hells Angel's girlfriend, and they were all in their black leather, and they had their colors and all this stuff on. And when we got there, they were drunk, and it was about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> and uh, they were walking around with these little baggies that looked like Skittles, in there, which were not Skittles. They're poppers. But they, I don't know what they were, <clears throat> but it was all manner of drugs, I'm sure. And they were just taking them, you know, just grabbing them out of each other's bags without even looking at them. And, uh, and this was early in the night. So... Um, so we go we go in there and uh, and the, the opening act was Big Brother and the Holding Company, her original band, and it's, uh, Nick Gravenitis, who was a blues player and singer with Paul Butterfield's band, was singing lead that night. Sam Andrew, who was her original guitar player, showed up with his arm in a cast. He had a broken arm. And he was playing lead guitar with <laughs> a broken arm. So um, anyway. Uh, we're standing out in the in the audience. There was no seats or anything, and everybody, all the all the Hell's Angels were just drunk and stoned, and it was a very kind of dangerous environment. And, uh, and there I was, this kid from Westport, Connecticut, you know, in my khakis and, <laughs> and button-down shirt, and uh, so it was almost like having a target on you. Mm -hmm. So, um, so what happened was. The, the big brother came out and they started to play and uh, Nick Gravenitis would always sing with his eyes closed so they're getting into the first song and we're standing there watching and all of a sudden this beautiful young girl jumps up on stage and she starts dancing and she takes all her clothes off <laughs> so uh, the crowd starts reacting to this you know the guys are going yeah they're going crazy you know and and uh, Nick is, I look at Nick, he's still got his eyes closed. He doesn't see what's going on. And I'm thinking, well, he's probably thinking he's having a good night. Yeah. You know? oh. So uh, it's off to a good start. <laughs> so then some guy gets up on stage, young guy, and he takes all his clothes off and he's dancing with the girl. So now the crowd's really digging it, and Nick's eyes are still closed. <laughs> They're about three feet away from him. He doesn't know what's going on, but he thinks this is, you know, this is great. So with that, <laughs> they go down to the, on the stage and they start having sex on, on the stage, right about three <laughs> feet from Nick. So Was everyone cheering them on, like, go, go. <laughs> so then, <laughs> then they just, the place just, <clears throat> just went wild and went crazy and every, all, everybody's screaming and yelling and Nick still got his eyes closed. <laughs> and he's got to be thinking his, his head, star is his head's risen. getting bigger. <laughs> yeah, right. He's got it made. He never has to work again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they end the song. He opens his eyes and he looks down. <laughs> he sees these two kids 
<laughs> going at it on stage, and he jumps back, and the expression on his face was one that I could never unsee. <laughs> I'll always remember the look on his face. Um, it was really a shock. So we figured that was probably the craziest thing that was going to happen. But then while we're standing there, um, Janice is standing next to this girl who has a bottle and she of uh, some kind of uh, like whiskey or something, and and she reaches over and she says, "Hey man, let me have a swig of that because I'm going on in a couple of minutes and I and I need it. I need a drink." So this girl bats her hand away and slugs her in the face. Slugs so, Janice Jan- in the face. Yeah. Oh my God. Full fisted. <laughs> so Janice slugs her right back in the face. <laughs> Now the two of them start going at it, and they're on the floor, girl fight, beating the hell out of each other, and we're trying to pull them apart, and uh, we finally get them apart, and uh, two of the Hell's Angels, one who was with Janice and one was who was with the other, the girl, they decide that they need to defend the honor of each of these young ladies, and so they pull a knife, they each pull a knife, and they start circling each other like going to kill oh. each other and now all the other hell's angels are cheering them on oh. you know kill them <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, so God. i'm looking for the exit sign <laughs> yeah now, you know i figured in but back of one of the martial lamps there was a, a, a red sign and i'm thinking can i get over that martial lamp in one jump <laughs> but you're responsible for for janice yeah but right? at that point yeah. i was it was oh, an yeah. existential kind of moment survival <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like every, <laughs> every man for himself <laughs> at some point yeah um Anyway, instead of killing each other, uh, they decide that they're brothers and why are they doing this? And they start hugging and Uh, kissing. uh, And so so (laughs) nobody had to die that night. And then Janice got up on stage and she absolutely crushed it. It was like one of the greatest performances I ever saw her give. It was great. So that was the first night, the first performance of her last band, uh, Janice Joplin in concert. And mm-hmm. these guys had the exclusive right to that, and they probably raised about 300 bucks because probably I figured two out of five didn't pay the dollar. <laughs> you know, so. Was it recorded? No. no. In fact, I, oh. the only pictures that exist of that, I believe, are the ones that I took. And I'm not even sure about those because I can't tell... I can't really tell where it was, but, the but there was no press there, or any n- oh. no civilians except for me and Albert. And, uh, oh man, that's uh, amazing! Janice. Any other like I know nothing's going to reach to that level <laughs> that you just told us. It's almost, it's impossible. But um, <laughs> is there any other great performance stories, uh, or just great performances? I'll just leave it. It doesn't uh, have to be a knife well, fight involved. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't. I don't know about the performances. As I'm, as I'm writing this book, I tell the, you know a few funny stories. Um, Janice, uh, this is, Janice stories are uh, abound because she was such a wild one. But um, you know, I have a few stories that are that are not necessarily performance stories that are pretty funny. You know, mm-hmm. interesting. Sort of Ooh, out of all the things. performers you've worked with. Um, who was like the, the the biggest problem? Oh yeah, personality. I always wondered. Yeah, sometimes you you meet your heroes when they might not be in your heroes, and you know they disappoint. When you meet them, they disappoint. You wish they had just you had distance. So yeah, that kind of same along those well, lines. I, Anybody that was a I. I a, a fan club. Your fan club out there. Every time I look over here. <laughs> it's, I think um, you should sit here. Yeah, yeah. Really. Um, so. Uh, well, the the person that I didn't care for the most, which my wife always tells me not to talk ill of anybody because it's not nice. Right, it may come. Uh, uh, facts are but, facts. But, you know, yeah. Todd Rundgren was really a pain in the ass. <laughs> 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 and uh, from the time I met him till the last day I saw him, he was always hmm. kind of an arrogant, difficult self-centered a dick you know, you can say a dick. <laughs> yeah. he's a narcissist i mean i've yeah. known a, oh, yeah. a dozen maybe in my life and he was probably the first one that i was able to identify as pure mm-hmm. narcissist um talented you know yeah uh, but uh very much uh into his own you know world sure um and, but there but on the other side of that th- some of the most incredible people i ever met in my life were 
in that you know time of my life like uh, I worked with Clive Davis for a couple of years um, as his executive assistant back when I was a kid and I worked with Albert Grossman both those guys were total brilliant interesting guys that um, you know it was a f just a fantastic mm. experience of just being in their presence and watching the way that they work and think and and they couldn't have been more different personality wise but t they were both really brilliant and then as far as artists go my favorite uh, my two favorite artists were Levon Helm and um, Chris Christopherson <clears throat> and Chris being kind of the most interesting guy that I worked with he was I spent, I've been spending a lot more time writing about him than I probably should mm. because the book is not going to be, um, you know, an in-depth thing. It's kind of a mini memoir, but mostly about the photographs. But I keep finding myself going on about how Chris, because I found him to be so interesting and talented and kind of a renaissance man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just more thoughtful. Any projects you're working on now that... Well, I'm working on the book. I yeah, think that's, right. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah, that's a lot bigger job. Sure, than sure. I that's a huge job. Be. Yeah. And we're working on uh, the Phoenix Art Museum is doing a, an exhibit in November, which we just found out about. We went out there and talked to them, so that's that's fun. And, um, and the Hall of Fame thing is going on for another few months. That's but uh, so no, we're just sort of taking it a step at a time. We don't really have any um, gallery stuff set up at the moment. I saw reading, you know, material about you uh, that you worked with Bert Block. Who, who's that? Oh, Bert Block was a great, uh, great old time, kind of one of these. Uh, uh, oh, how do I describe Bert? He was an old time uh, agent manager, and he worked in the old days with Billy Holiday and some of those people from that time and he had been Albert's partner when I first joined Albert Grossman um, I la he he lived in uh, South Salem and he had an office in uh, Ridgefield so at the time when I moved from Woodstock back to Connecticut uh, he asked me to join him in Ridgefield managing Chris and Rita Rita Coolidge uh, and I think he had Mickey Newberry and a couple of other artists, but basically Chris and Rita. Was, but that's when I was working with Chris and Rita. It was with Bert Block, mm -hmm. and uh, and he was just a great character. He was he was just one of these guys who get on the phone and just start yelling at the agents, <laughs> and, you know, fighting with, with everybody. And, um, you know, it just was a throwback to a, a kind of the forties and fifties, yeah. Yeah. yeah, old school. Yeah. Character smoked like a <laughs> I was going to say, did he have a big cigar? <laughs> no, he smoked cigarettes like one oh, off of the other, oh, you know, oh. just a chain <laughs> smoker. <laughs> and we used to go to Bernard's in Ridgefield oh, for yeah. lunch every day. <laughs> God, so I didn't like that place anymore. <laughs> Can't we go somewhere else? <laughs> but anyway. I just wanted to put your, your, grew up in this area and just briefly put your life in perspective here. You've had a lot of careers. I mean, I'm just. Artifacts, Ash Creek Saloon. I mean, you want to just briefly go through uh, some yeah. of your early develop um, development that got you? My wife describes me as Forrest Gump uh, <laughs> because I've never had a plan, which is pretty obvious just from what you said. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I've, I've kind of lived my life, um, like I say, without a real plan. I, I've always done what I want to do without thinking about whether it was a good idea or how one would go about doing that if one were intelligently trying to figure it out. So, you know, I, I loved antiques and I got involved with antiques uh, back in the 70s and I started out as a collector and I ended up as a dealer. I had a shop in Westport for years and, uh, and then I started going over to Europe and was buying antiques there, doing Wiener Werkstatt and Bauhaus stuff long before it was saleable, <laughs> which was usually my pattern. <laughs> they used to say, oh, he's time. so ahead of his time. Yeah. And I said, you know what? It's not so good being ahead of your time. It's good to be in your time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but anyway, 
uh, I started seeing these these sort of uh, great design objects in Europe that you couldn't find in the United mm. States. Things for the house, you know, kind of these really neat high tech in those days, high tech things. And uh, so I found that I would walk the streets and I would go in, into these shops and I would see something that I thought was really cool and I would t talk into this voice activated recorder in my pocket and I would then go back to my hotel and I'd track down the source for it and then I would have it shipped. I'd buy, you know, buy it and send it over here and I had a shop right in Westport next to my antique shop called Artifacts that Migs just mentioned. And, um, and it was all these kind of objects that you couldn't find in the United States. Now you can find anything. Everything is everywhere. You, know, you go to the New York gift show and you can find all those things. But they were really cool yeah. things at the time and nobody else had them. And so I just decided to do a store around it. And then I started getting involved with cowboy and western antiques because uh, I had been doing mostly American folk art and country 18th century, 19th century Americana. But um, I always loved cowboy stuff as a kid. So I tried getting involved with that, but there was no, no way to learn about it here. And there was nobody selling it and buying it. There was no books on it. So I decided to do the book on it so that I could learn. So I traveled around the country doing that for about a year and uh, interviewing all these great collectors, the best collections in, in the country. Western yeah. artifacts. And I uh, put out a book mm -hmm. on that, which is still, it's actually still in print. And wow. uh, that was 1992. Mm -hmm. So it's been around for a well, That led time. to ribs <laughs> somehow? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what led to the uh, Ash Creek Saloon, actually. Cause, uh, the one that was in Norwalk? The, the one that we started, started in Fairfield. Fairfield. Oh, it's Fairfield. And Ash Creek, right? That's yeah. the real creek, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it was... You know, I, I decorated it with all the mm, period antique stuff, you know, old shops and, you know, all kinds of antiques and um, things that you might have seen in a real saloon sure, 100 yeah. years ago. And to this day, I've never seen a place like that out west. I can't believe mm. it. You know, I've always thought I should probably go out there and do one, but I decided I'm not going to live that long. <laughs> yeah. I love restaurants like that. have artifacts oh, things yeah. hanging from the ceiling or like, on the walls and yeah you're immersed in the in the history and the culture it was a lot of fun we had a great time doing that the first one was really fun we it was uh quite and, an experience and great food yeah i love the i mean yeah the ribs really good. were what we were known for uh, they used to have there were guys doing blogs on how we did our ribs, oh, really? and they'd sneak by there in the middle of the night trying to find <laughs> our smoker and you know, <laughs> figure out how we were doing it. It turns out we didn't have a smoker. <laughs> we, were, we were going to BJ's. I mean, what were you doing? <laughs> and we, we did that, actually, when the day we opened. We, we were mobbed. We didn't even know we were going to be open. And all of a sudden, it was like 200 people in the place. I don't know how they even knew because wow. I didn't know until 4 o'clock in the afternoon that we were going to get our permit. Anyway, this guy says to me, what's for dessert? And I said, I forgot <laughs> to get dessert. <laughs> we, we didn't even have it on the menu. So I ran over to BJ's. You did? Okay. Well, and they had these big apple pies that were so great, you know. <laughs> so I bought a couple of them, and I brought them back, and we put ice cream on them. <clears throat> and people were talking about the apple pie That's at the Ash Creek amazing. Saloon. And we used to have that there all the time. And then I thought, this is crazy. You know, you can walk down the street at block and a half <laughs> and our secret is no longer a secret well we're running out of time we've got okay. a few seconds left any wrap up uh, just uh, the impact that's had on in 15 seconds or any what, wrap up, what, kind, of, kind of overview you want to have of your you know what rock and roll was meant to the our generation the culture well uh, that's a more than a minute yeah, I answer, <laughs> but I, I will say that you know Westport has is, is plays a real special part in that for me. Oops. Yeah, that's right. We got um, a few seconds. And uh, you know, thanks to Barry Tashin and my first band, the Schemers. Oh, the Schemers. Oh yeah, yeah. you were in the uh, Schemers. Del Richard Del Vecchio. They were yeah, my class. Del yeah, Del Vecchio. Yeah. Mike Vecchio. Youngman. Yeah. And what did you play? Yeah. I played drums. 
Oh, wow. And, and that was the beginning of it all. And that's what sort of you play out in the You play out in the plaza there after, during lunch or something. Yeah, yeah I remember and that all well. the, the dances at the cafeteria at Staples. Yeah. All right, we got to say goodbye. Okay. All right. Thanks so much, fun. Michael yeah, thanks Friedman. a lot. It's terrific. Great.